Okay, so I think we can start. Still some people are connecting, but uh, at the beginning we will have a short introduction. So uh, my name is Karolina and I would like to welcome you to today's uh, lecture. It's kind of a Christmas session today. And at the beginning, allow me a short introduction about this concept. Uh, so life after PhD or uh, career cafe life uh, has been organized since uh, 2018 and it's an event series that aims to showcase uh, PhD holders who to various uh, PhD pathways, uh, career pathways, and it's a great opportunity uh, mainly for young researchers to uh, listen to the inspiring speakers, uh, listen to their story and ask great questions. And we invite speakers from academia and also from private sector. And newly we organized this uh, session with uh, twinning partners. So it's my pleasure to welcome here also uh, participants outside the SATEC. And today's uh, lecture will be uh, moderated by uh, Sabrina Dietz, who took her uh, bachelor and master in molecular biology in Frankfurt. And then she continued uh, to her uh, PhD uh, at the Institute of Moncom uh, Medicine in Mainz in Germany. Uh, and then uh, there she focused on, uh, uh, or she focused in her research on telomere binding proteins in C. elegans under the supervision of uh, Falk Butter. And after graduation and uh, finishing up her uh, manuscript, uh, she started to work uh, as coordinator of the international PhD program. So I think that Sabrina uh, is the right person to introduce you uh, our guest, uh, Maria Placentino, and also moderate uh, today's lecture. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write them to the chat box or just raise your hand. So I think that uh, we can start with the lecture. So Sabrina, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carolina. Hey, welcome everybody to today's Career Cafe Live. As Carolina already said, we will have Maria today talk about her uh, career pathway uh, coming from um, a bachelor's and master's degree in Italy at the University of Bologna, where she studied industrial biotechnology. She then came to the IMB, the Institute of Molecular Biology in Mainz in 2013 to work in the group of René Ketting on um, identification and characterization of silencing pathways involved in RNA mediated epigenetic silencing. Um, and this is where I also met her back in the day. So I started in 2015, she was already there and she was one of the worm people that taught me how to work with C. elegans and how to prepare strains and how to take care of my worms. So we also closely collaborated for her manuscript then, where I did with my group of Falkbutta the mass spectrometry analysis for her um, project. And yeah, she completed her PhD in 2019 and then finished up with a postdoc in the Ketting lab. And afterwards, in February 2020, she left the lab to start a current position as site management associate at ICANN, which is a clinical research organization that provides support to biotech and pharma companies. So she will let you know exactly what that means and also what she does in her day to day life. And Maria, the floor is yours. And as Carolina already said, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat and afterwards ask them by raising your hand and then I will uh, let you know that you can ask your question to Maria directly. Thank you. Hi uh, everyone. Thank you Sabrina for the very nice uh, introduction. Uh, I will uh, then uh, share my screen and try to <laughs> tell you a bit more about uh, what I'm doing and how I got to this position. So um, you know, and I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy to have been invited to give such a talk and uh, I think it's a very nice uh, initiative which uh, 
was not really uh, happening at the time when I was doing my PhD. So I hope that this uh, may be useful to at least to some of you. <laughs> so I am uh, uh, from Italy, uh, originally from a, a small town in the south of Italy. And uh, I lived there until uh, I finished high school. And then, um, you know, I was thinking about what I would do in the future. And I didn't want to stay in, um, like in my uh, hometown, mostly because uh, I wanted to go to university and there was no university there. So I would have had to move anyway to a different uh, city. And I decided then to um, go to a bit more north than my hometown. So I studied uh, biotechnology, uh, studied my bachelor in biotechnology at the University of Bologna. And uh, later on, I continued with my master in molecular and industrial biotechnology. So as you can see, so this is uh, where I studied. It's a very nice uh, uh, university city uh, and um, it was a very nice experience very nice atmosphere um, and um, I uh, graduated in 2013 from my master's um, so what did I do in those times I um, did my uh, very first experience in the lab so actually before I decided to study biotechnology I was somehow um, completely uh, differently oriented. So I wanted to become an interpreter and study languages until uh, more or less when I finished high school. Uh, but then uh, um, somehow I got uh, more in, uh, attracted towards science and therefore I went to Bologna to study biotechnology as it was a course that had a lot of uh, practical um, experiences in the lab. Uh, which was not always the case in other courses um, that I looked at. And so I moved to uh, Bologna and I had my first um, um, experience in the, in the lab. So my first internship was during my bachelor where I worked at the Pediatric Oncology and Hematology Laboratory in Bologna, where we were trying to establish um, a model to monitor the development of uh, one, a Wilms pediatric tumor in uh, both in vitro and in vivo. So it was also my first experience with, uh, with mice and the first contact with the uh, clinical research. Um, this internship lasted about six months, so it was not uh, very long. And then I continued uh, after graduating from my bachelor, I continued with uh, my master. And at that time, when I had uh, the time came to And so I did my internship in the laboratory of Donald O'Carroll at the MBL in Monterotondo, um, where um, we studied the role of argonaut 2 phosphorylation of a serine 388 in different mice genetic backgrounds. So we were trying to figure out the relevance of this uh, um, uh, phosphorylation um, in, at the physiological level. And, um, but Today, I will not go too much in detail in the, the science part, let's say. Um, so um, uh, one of the reasons also I decided to join this lab was because I uh, got very interested in uh, small RNA biology during my um, master studies. And actually, we had a course uh, about small RNA biology at university, which I think was quite inspiring to many of us, as uh, quite some of my colleagues uh, also went to study um, further small RNAs and uh, did their PhD in different uh, organisms, uh, but uh, always focused on small RNA biology. And uh, so I decided that I wanted to continue in this path. And after um, several applications and interviews, I then joined the lab of uh, René Ketting in uh, um, uh, Mainz, as uh, 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 Sabrina and Carolina were saying. So I uh, was part of the international PhD program, and I also joined, uh, um, I uh, got awarded a fellowship uh, during my time as a PhD student as well. And uh, um, as uh, uh, Sabrina was mentioning, I then worked with uh, C. elegans with the characterization of uh, um, three novel proteins, um, which are related to epigenetic gene silencing in, in uh, C. elegans. Um, 
The reason why I uh, also decided to move away from mice biology was that it was a bit, uh, uh, I found it a bit <laughs> stressful, let's say. And so I um, decided to work with a more simpler organism, which then in the end was not as simple as I thought, <laughs> but at least uh, um, it was a change. So I um, always wanted to learn new things. And so it was interesting for me to work also with a different uh, um, organism to um, improve uh, my knowledge and you know, learn more things. Um, so I did my PhD from 2013 and I graduated in 2019. So it was a quite a longer PhD. Um, and then, uh, um, you know, I finally graduated, <laughs> but then I was really not sure what to do. So um, as um, uh, Sabrina was mentioning, we collaborated on, the, um, uh, on my paper. So she helped me with the mass spectrometry part. Um, graduated and um, I uh, stayed for six more months uh, in the lab and then uh, um, until uh, January 2020 and then uh, finally my paper uh, was published but this happened only after I left the lab <laughs> so in the meantime I was pretty much doing the new job and working on my paper at the same time. So, which was a bit uh, uh, intense period of time, but um, I'm happy that eventually it worked out. So during the time um, of my uh, postdoc, I was then wondering what I want to do next. So um, as you're probably familiar with uh, the life in the lab, you mostly get exposed to um, laboratory um, possibilities only. So, um, I was thinking if I uh, was considering if I wanted to maybe do uh, another postdoc in a different field to learn a bit more as I really enjoyed being in the lab. Uh, but then on the other hand, I was not really sure about that, mostly because I was not sure in which direction I would have liked to go. And also because as you may be aware, quite often to get an external funding, which is quite often required for postdoc positions, you need to move and uh, change country. And uh, I, I mean, I already moved from Italy to Germany. And after being here for seven, eight years now, I, I didn't really want to move again and start all over again, especially because I had already decided that I didn't want to um, follow the academic um, career to become eventually a PI. And so I thought that maybe doing a postdoc would only, let's say, postpone my decision of what to actually do um, later on. So in the end, I did not apply uh, for postdoc positions and I tried uh, to apply for uh, industry positions. Um, in the beginning, I was uh, mostly um, focusing on applications in the scientific field as well. So I mostly ap applied to scientist positions in different companies, but unfortunately they did not work out, mostly because um, quite often it was required to have a um, previous experience, with, which I did not have. I mean, I did work in the lab, so one would think that you have the experience, but um, somehow this was not always the case for uh, industry, mostly because I did the, my um, PhD in a very basic biology, so small RNAs in C. elegans, which is a bit difficult then to transfer to the um, uh, industry field, so to say. Uh, perhaps if I would have done a PhD in immunology or oncology, which are I was not sure eventually if I really wanted to um, do uh, to go for a scientist position in a company because I um, have heard from different people that even if you get such a position in industry, you would um, mostly, I mean, you would be in the lab, but not fully. And so I was afraid that I wouldn't really like it because it would be really different from what I did before. And I was not sure if I would enjoy that or not. And so after 
quite uh, some months of applications, I decided to be a bit more open-minded and try to apply also for different positions, which I did not really know what they would be, uh, but I thought I could fit uh, the role and sounded interesting. And so I started to apply to other kind of positions in, uh, in uh, industry as well. Eventually, a friend of mine uh, told me about this uh, site management associate position in uh, ICON. Actually, when I joined the company, it was called the PRAL Sciences. And in the meantime, the company got acquired by ICON. And so now uh, we have uh, a different name, <laughs> but um, I didn't uh, change a company, let's say. So I've been working as a site management associate since uh, February 2020. And um, as I mentioned before, uh, while I started the new job, I was also working uh, on the paper in my free time, so to say. And um, I joined the, uh, the real world solutions department. And um, basically um, what we do is we focus uh, mostly on uh, um, clinical trials of late phase, so to say. So we have um, uh, different therapeutic areas. So, so for example, personally, I have been working in studies in uh, neurology field, oncology and hematology. Um, and I did not really have previous experience in uh, this field or at least not in the diseases I've been working on lately and um, uh, we do uh, the monitoring part so basically we support the uh, clinical sites of the hospitals that do these uh, trials um, in order to ensure that they really follow the protocol and that they uh, collect the data from the patients properly that the patients are doing fine and that uh, they and uh, they collect all the data as it should be um, in the database so we also do the review of the um, clinical data that is entered in these databases. Um, also, uh, we do um, regulatory submissions. So we prepare the documents uh, for submission of uh, clinical trials to uh, ethics committees in different countries. And um, in the so-called trial master file, which is basically a huge database that contains all the documents uh, related to the trial that has to be always uh, ready for inspection and audit. And uh, from where you can kind of reconstruct the whole story of the, the study. Um, in my department, so the real world solutions department, um, it's actually very big and spread. So the company is uh, quite international. So it has uh, offices pretty much all over the world. And the real world solutions department is also in different uh, countries. Uh, so I am based uh, at the moment in Mannheim in Germany. And we do uh, take care of these trials uh, within Europe. So we are a very international team because we have to be able to support the hospital uh, staff in the local language. So for instance, I mostly work in Italian and in English. And then uh, we have, of course, colleagues from pretty much every other country in Europe. And this is very nice because I was afraid that when moving to industry, I would not have such an international environment as I had in the lab, which I really enjoyed. So I have to say I'm happy about this as well. And um, the people that my colleagues, so the people that work in this department, most of them have similar backgrounds. So they also did a PhD or a postdoc and then decided to move to industry. Um, even though I have to say that some other of my colleagues do not really have a clinical or biological background, but perhaps they study languages. And as I said, then it's really important to speak more lang multiple languages in order to be able to support different uh, um, clinical sites in different countries. And um, so most of the things I have, you pretty much will learn on the job. So that was the, for me the case. I did not have, uh, as I said, the previous experience in this field as I started directly after the, the lab. But it was a good ent entry level position. In the meantime, I also got uh, promoted a few months ago. So it is nice to see that, you know, I, 
It's, uh, if you do a good job, it is recognized, which uh, it's not always the case in academia, to say. Um, then I, I was not sure exactly um, how to um, yeah, continue, like what else would be useful to say. So I tried to put together some um, topics that would be maybe useful for discussion. So um, the challenges that I had, for example, when I was applying, as I said, Quite often, um, I think it was the, sub, the let's say, lack of experience. It, because once you decided to, decide to change completely the field, you you will really start from zero, pretty much. So um, want to find a job but you apply but then most of the times you don't have the experience that they need but if you don't start the job how will you get experience so it's kind of a circle which was uh, at some point very frustrating and uh, uh, for me personally um, also I think some of the positions I did not really uh, get uh, go forward with the uh, application process um, because my application was always in English and sometimes um, I think they as I was I was applying only in Germany I forgot to say and so it may be that some of the positions they would have appreciated more if my CV and cover letter would have been in German so this is also something that you may want to consider if you want to apply in a local language you know, in some cases, this can be useful, even though um, most of the times if you work, I mean, of course, it depends in which environment you would uh, then go on to work. Uh, but um, most of the times um, you will still have an international environment and uh, um, work will be in English and the meetings will be in English, but uh, not always. So this is also something to keep in mind. Also regarding then additional skills, uh, personally, I did not do any additional courses, so I um, learned, like, I got additional trainings when I started the job, of course, because I had to learn, learn everything again from scratch, which is also what I wanted, like, when I finished my um, PhD, I really wanted to do something new and uh, new challenges and, um, yeah, change the field completely. And... Um, Nonetheless, you do have a lot of skills during, that you learn during your PhD and postdoc. And so during the time you're in the lab, you just have to think about it and uh, um, highlight them and write them in your CV and application. Um, so you definitely have uh, presentation skills and writing skills as you are um, or will be writing your paper, your uh, thesis. Uh, so this is something that uh, can be definitely uh, transferred to a different environment. Um, you will uh, have uh, definitely organizational skills, time management skills, project management skills, which um, maybe you wouldn't call them like that, but in the end, that's what you do every day in the lab, managing your projects and um, different experiments in parallel and so on. So uh, this is definitely something that you already have. You just have to highlight it, let's say. And um, also uh, you uh, have to think about some experiences that you have done outside the lab uh, because um, these are then the skills that um, may make a difference later on. Um, so to stand out from the rest. And this does not have necessarily to be something that is strictly work related, but perhaps you did some volunteering activities or you were a student representative or you were involved in some other organization of events and this um, is of course also appreciated and can be um, uh, used uh, in the in other fields as well also it is very important to include examples in your cv and also when doing interviews so um, instead of just mentioning some skills that you have it's good to um, put some concrete um, examples um, during your application and um, regarding work-life balance, I um, 
work approximately eight hours per day, uh, which is not always the case, but usually the good thing is that um, my work is quite flexible. So if I work more one day, I, I can work less the next day and they are trying to also keep an eye on that so they don't want that you do too many other hours and if you do because of some deadlines or some extra work that needs to be done that is fine but then they want you to take more time off um, and um, yeah, weekends are always free, <laughs> which may not always be the case in the lab, at least, um, yeah, this is what I remember from my time in the lab. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I still find work a bit stressful, of course, depends on the time period. But overall, I think it's, um, yeah, you have quite a good balance between work and uh, free time and uh, so life outside of work. Um, as I did not have uh, so such a long career, so to say, I am already <laughs> finished with my presentation. So I would like to thank you again once more for the invitation today. And um, I hope that uh, I have transmitted something useful uh, to you. And uh, as I think you are in different stages of your PhD or career in the lab, I wish you good luck for the next steps. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have and continue the discussion. OK, thank you very much, Maria. Um, we already have some questions in the chat. Um, I will just start from the top. So Carolina already uh, wrote two questions in the chat during your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, one is, what aspects or criteria were crucial in your career decision? Um, so, um, as I said, I was actually, um, first of all, I decided that I did which was a bit more useful because, I mean, when I worked in the lab, I really liked it and I really enjoyed the time in the lab and working with the C elegance and on my project. But then quite often when I was speaking with my family or my friends, then they were asking, yeah, you do such a lot of work, but in the end, why do you do that? <laughs> and, you know, of course it's basic research. So you do it just to know how things work and to find out, which is of course also very important for clinical research, because if you don't have a very good basic research, you also have difficulties later on with the clinical research, so more applied research. But then on the other hand, I really felt that after so many years of being in the lab, really working a lot, in the end, I, you know, I did not really have any results very soon, you know, like you will have it, but after many years, maybe what I studied during my PhD would be useful at some point for something, but it's not something that I would see directly. So I wanted to do something that would give me a bit more this feeling that I'm doing something useful and that I can see the results at the, you know, in a bit shorter term. And so I thought maybe something in the clinical research then would be nice because then I would feel a bit more that I'm doing something useful, so to say, or that you would see it a bit more uh, immediately. And so um, I was applying to some positions also, for example, in uh, um, for consulting, even though I was not 100% sure if I would like it. But as I said, at some point, I just thought I will just apply. And then once I do the interviews, I will have a bit better idea of what the job would be and if I would like it or not. Because yeah, being in the lab, it's difficult to know what the other positions are. When you read the description, it's very difficult to know. So, um, yeah, I think this was a bit my, my reasoning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then maybe just to connect to the long hours in the lab, another question would be if you have any tips on how to maintain a work-life balance during your PhD. <laughs> um, so I have to say that I, I just had very well different uh, periods, so to say. So of course, when it was more busy, I was doing longer hours and uh, also working on weekends. But then I had some other times where it was uh, not, you know, a bit more quiet. Then I would really avoid the weekend as much as possible because I also realized that if I didn't have a break, then I would be already tired on Monday, and you know that was not good. <laughs> um, 
in the lab, I mean, that really depends, I think, on the project and what you're doing, because sometimes you can, of course, arrange it that you have multiple uh, experiments running at the same time so that you can uh, then try to finish in a, at a more decent time. But that is not always so possible. I think it's a bit difficult. You know, the coming weeks, I would try to take it a bit more easy for, you know, the extent possible, of course, mm. because it's not always uh, the case. I guess prioritizing definitely helps. Yes. If it can be done tomorrow, do exactly, it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you, exactly. You don't have to do all at the same time. Just make a clear list of what needs to be done first, and then the rest will come later. Okay, good. Then we have some questions about the company itself, ICANN. So... Mm -hmm. Um, one question would be to give some general information about ICANN because people mm -hmm. didn't know this company before. Yes. So if you can just give some general information. Yeah. So um, as I said, ICON, uh, well, I mean, I started in a career science, which is now acquired by ICON. So now it's a, a big company. So it's actually very big. I think we are like, I don't know, 60,000 employees or something like this. And it's everywhere in the, in the world. Uh, so it's a contract research organization and basically uh, the company is responsible for conducting clinical trials for pharma companies. So basically the pharma companies um, would pay ICON to conduct the clinical trials because we have more the experience of conducting clinical trials and it's quite time consuming and um, quite often this, uh, the pharma companies prefer to pay someone else to do the job because it yeah, it saves them time and efforts, and uh, they just delegate their these responsibilities to this this uh, the CRO. In this case, Icon. Um, there are um, various departments. So of course, there is the Department of Medical Affairs and the Regulatory Affairs that uh, then are responsible for different aspects of clinical trials. Um, then uh, we have uh, um, different departments that, of course, um, uh, so as I said, I am part of the real world solution department, so we mostly work for uh, late phase uh, trials, but then there are different departments that take care of phases of clinical trials of phase one, two, three. And um, so it's really kind of a company that does a support Mm, and it's in between the pharma companies and the hospitals that are doing the clinical trials. I hope it yeah, answered the question. I can try to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you very much. Um, the next one would be, what skills did your employer, or in this case, it was then still a PR health science. Mm -hmm. So what did they require from you? Is there any specific things they asked about? During the interview, was there some kind of medical test? Because I mean, there's a lot of medical knowledge you kind of need to learn now, I guess. Um, so <laughs> if you have any specific things that you remember during your interview procedure. And uh, um, they wanted to have some, I mean, if you were looking at the uh, description, it was explaining a bit the position and the skills that they wanted to have was someone that is uh, um, able to uh, prioritize and to um, do a bit of project management. So, you know, manage different projects at the same time, which is, again, something that you do in the lab already. And um, so a bit to these organizational skills and um, so nothing very specific, I have to say, but then during my interview, they really asked me everything that was related to soft skills. So they didn't ask me anything about what I did during my time in the lab, <laughs> but they only focused on what I wrote in my CV related to other skills. Like, I don't know, I said that I organized the, the lab retreat for 15 people. And then they asked me, ah, can you explain a bit more? What exactly did you have to do? What challenges did you have in this organization? And all of this. So they really asked me about this, for example. And then uh, I had put that, for example, I was also participating in the interviews of uh, colleagues and for onboarding of new colleagues. So they asked me to explain a bit more. 
um, what exactly did I do? And then uh, um, they also asked me some questions about some maybe difficult situations and how would be my approach to this. So I think they also want to see your problem uh, solving uh, sol uh, skills. Uh, but um, as I said, it was really a lot focused on uh, these extra external skills, let's say, that I put in my CV and um, that's what they asked. And they also what, tested the, the languages I could speak because as I said, it was also required to, it was preferred to have people that can speak more than two languages because then you are able to, uh, let's say, cover, uh, be responsible for more countries at the same time within the same project, which is also useful. Uh, but yeah, as I said, it was all skills that I have learned with personal experience, so to say. It was nothing very specific. And then regarding the clinical uh, um, skills as i said this i'm i'm really learning every day you know whenever i have a new study then i have to read the, what is this about uh, research a bit about the disease because i don't have such a clinical background but this yeah, you learn on the job so. mm -hmm. okay i guess then um the question that shamita wrote in the chat is actually something that would fit to this uh, line of discussion knowing what you know now is there something you would have done differently during your phd to prepare for industry as i was looking for jobs in germany i would definitely learn german better i mean i can speak german but I never used it for work and, you know, I did not have any documents for my application that were prepared in German and, you know, this may have been also then different. I would have done more uh, courses, which I didn't do at the time because, you know, you never have time, you always have experiments to do, but all these courses that are offered within PhD uh, programs like uh, pro um, project management or uh, organization or time, time management, like, you know, these uh, kind of courses are uh, definitely useful and I would have done them. Uh, I think there were also some GMP courses or, something like this, I would definitely have done more of these um, courses because in the end, if you want to change, this is what will make the difference and this is what you will be able to use again because the pipetting then you will not <laughs> use anymore. So, yeah. Okay, so yeah, then coming to that point also, do you feel like your job is as interesting and as exciting as your PhD, for example, or do you think it's a more repetitive thing? Mm, so I was very much afraid when I changed the, from the lab that I would be extremely bored at the computer all the time. <laughs> um, but this is not the case. So, I mean, uh, mm, there are, of course, some uh, tasks that you have to do every month or well, not really every day. I mean, I, I still feel that every day looks a bit different. And um, depending on the projects you have, also you have to do different things. So it's always a bit, even though like, you know, the basic things are kind of the same and they are common to all projects. In the end, what you have to do every day and for every project is a little bit different. And um, yeah, you don't have time to get bored because there is also a lot of work to do. Um, and it's a bit difficult to compare because I really like the time in the lab, but then also at the end, I was also quite done with the lab because I was always doing the same things and a lot of genotyping with my worms. And, you know, like in the end, this was also always the same, you know, and, uh, but now for me, it's still um, a new, so to, I mean, I haven't done this job for two years yet, you know, so it's not so long that I started. I don't think I will do it forever, but uh, I still feel that I'm learning and that, uh, um, yeah, it, it's still something new. Perhaps next year, then I will not feel this way and I want to change, but, uh, for now, I still find it uh, interesting and challenging because then you can have different kind of issues that you have to take care of, and it's all uh, 
inspiring talk and mm -hmm. asks, what would you consider to be your greatest achievement in your professional life so far? Um, so, I mean, I didn't have such a long professional life, so probably my PhD is still the greatest achievement. But, you know, then I also feel that, I, as I said, I changed completely field and I feel that I, I learned a lot and I'm learning a lot. And uh, you see when you have different deadlines, I don't know that you have uh, some from the, uh, the pharma company uh, that, you know, pays us and then you have to do something by the end of the month but it's not really dependent on you but you have to make sure that the people that are working in the hospital will do it which is not always easy and uh, uh, you know when you see that they actually listen to you and they do what you tell them and they do it properly then you feel you know great that you feel satisfied because you did your job and they you you did it well because they also uh, were able to do what they were supposed to do on time and every, and so on and um, so this is, uh, yeah, in general, it's a nice uh, <laughs> feeling, <laughs> but uh, yeah. And as I said, I mean, it was completely a, a new job. And I, I think in general, it's a, yeah, a good achievement to be able to change completely and do something new and see that the people recognize that you do a good job and you feel that, you know, you're actually doing a good job and you see the results. And I think that is, yeah definitely something okay good then we have another question also from katka did you have a mentor to address challenges during your phd uh, not really <laughs> so i mean um during my phd um of course there were more um, experienced students that you would ask questions and so especially in the beginning this was um very useful um but it was not a mentor like not an official mentor per se so to say so it was just a reference point of phd students or postdocs that were in the same lab and that of course were more experienced and you could ask uh, questions and also of course the pi but not um someone like very specific like for instance when i changed job here i had an official mentor of, at least for the beginning you know then in, that would be your reference point. Um, so during my PhD, it was a bit of everyone that was more experienced than me, so to say. Um, then another question from Shamita. How did you go about looking for jobs? Did you use any specific websites or? Yeah. Mm. So I um, looked at different websites. So I was. And uh, yeah, so I was using different uh, websites to look for jobs and uh, yeah, LinkedIn as well as a, a platform. And um, I remember I also went to a career fair at the, from Job Vector in Frankfurt. Um, and uh, yeah, so I was just doing a bit of research everywhere. And also I looked at the specific companies. So if I had some company in mind, I would also look at directly at their website because sometimes maybe they have more offerings that you that they will not advertise in other websites. Uh, and that will also be yeah useful, I think. Okay, good. Then Carolina put another question to go a bit away from all the working and challenges and PhD. Um, she was asking now, what do you do in your free time to relax? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, considering that since I started my new job, there was the pandemic, <laughs> I could not do too much like outside uh, of work, so to say. So I uh, still spend quite some time at home, I have to say, but um, I uh, yeah go to the gym or yeah watch Netflix like nothing very sp uh, special I would say quite uh, normal um, but I do like yeah to do some sports especially because I'm sitting the whole day at the computer and so it's good to yeah get a bit of a change and um, um, yeah then I also like to go around a bit in the city to see get to know a bit more as I basically moved to Mannheim when I changed jobs. 
and um, I'm still uh, trying to improve my German. <laughs> so this is also not very relaxing, but it's also something that I do in my free time. Um, yeah, and um, socializing with my neighbors and doing some activities with them as well. <laughs> Yeah, then maybe I just add the question from Elena to this. Did you have time for hobbies during your PhD? <laughs> and well, no, it was pretty much <laughs> the same. Even though there was no COVID at the time, it's not that I had a lot of time to do other stuff. So I was also <laughs> trying to go to the gym. And uh, um, I mean, of course, I did hang out with the people from uh, from the lab. Uh, so going out uh which i yeah, also do nowadays as well but uh, yeah. i remember weekend trips i remember weekend the packed trips, suitcases yes. <laughs> exactly this i could i cannot do much as much as i would like now even though i would have the time but uh yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay then the next question is from violetta how many cvs have you sent and how many interviews did you have before scoring the position CVs. So I, I was trying to remember when I started, but I do not remember. So I, the thing is that I started to apply uh, probably already in 2018 because I was supposed to graduate in 2019. And so I was already looking, but then my contract got extended. And also I really sent out very few applications, maybe at the end of 2018, because then I was just trying to do one thing at the time. So I want, I was then focusing on writing my thesis and finishing in the lab. And then after I graduated, I restarted to um, apply again. And uh, so then it took more or less um, six months, but then I was really applying. So I was really doing it every week. So I, I mean, I don't know how many CVs I sent, but I think I done at least, uh, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 maybe. I can't remember, but I did quite quite a lot. It's just that, uh, um, as I said, quite often, then I was getting just these automatic replies like, ah, no, sorry, uh, not selected. We will not continue with your application. And um, and then I got, I just did this interview and I, I, I got the job. And later on, I had the one other interview, uh, which was actually for a postdoc position and scientific institute so it was not really academia but you know kind of so still scientist position postdoc position but this was already after i had started my job but my because my application was sent out like more than six months before but that's also something that you have to keep in mind that sometimes they have to they will uh, contact you very much later on and so it was already more than six months and then they told me that they wanted to have an interview so i thought i will do it and then see if you know, maybe I would still like to change or not, but then I wouldn't have done it anyway. And uh, yeah, so that's how it went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then since you said you didn't want to switch countries for your job currently, but do you think you will ever want to go back or do you want to stay here indefinitely? Mm. <laughs> this I don't know. I have to say, especially this uh, month, this last month, when I was just working from home all the time and not really meeting colleagues. And, uh, you know, then I also thought hey, what I'm doing here, maybe I should just go back to Italy. But then that's also the thing that uh, I am from the, the South and uh, um, there are not so many opportunities in the South. So then I will probably have to move somewhere North of Italy. And of course it would be more comfortable for the language. But then on the other hand, it would still be completely a new start again and uh, I don't know if I want to do it and also because if I would live anyway so far away from my family as I'm doing right now it wouldn't really change much from that point of view so maybe not but I have to say before I never considered it but in the last months I was thinking that maybe I could do it at some point I don't know if it's because of the current situation or yeah. just because you know why not i mean there would be for example this uh, cro they are there are also in italy it's just that they are yeah they all have offices in milan for example so then if i would go i would go to milan but i don't know if i want to do that <laughs> so but yeah. yeah that's good 
Um, yeah, then we have a more serious question from Esther. Um, it seems that your current job is more motivating for you than your PhD and the work in the lab due to the fact, as you said, results are seen faster and you get regular positive feedback. Um, would you say that lack of motivational factors could be the reason for depression and mental health problems that can be seen in academia quite often? Mm, yeah, the, uh, definitely, because I think, yeah, when you see you put a lot of work and then you don't really get anything, I think you can get quite frustrated. And uh, I think this can also lead to depression. Probably this also depends a bit on the personal uh, situation and personality of each person because you know everyone is a bit different and reacts a bit different to stress and to high workload and pressure but um, in the end you know if you don't take for example regular breaks and you're pretty much in the lab all the time every weekend and you never really get a break and some time for yourself to feel better and rest a bit I think this can result also in this but this can, of course, also happen in other fields, you know, when you have very high demanding jobs, this could also happen, uh, but I think it could definitely be a factor as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, then I have another question. So you probably at the moment are doing a lot of home office, right? Mm -hmm. So um, since you're doing clinical monitoring, is it also normally the case that you would visit the clinics where the studies are taking place that you go on site to talk to people or is it purely in front of your computer either at home or in an office yeah actually i would be at my computer either way <laughs> trials um, then you would also go on site to talk to the people and check what they are doing so this is usually done for more early phase uh, studies and the position is actually called the clinical research associate so it's a CRA so it's a bit different position but in a way also similar to what I'm doing so I think um, the CRA position is different that uh, you know you work with the earlier phase studies and also you would have to travel and then uh, but then as i said you know i at some point i also consider that but for cra you usually need to have some experience before already so for example maybe it would be something that i could apply now that i have almost two years experience but not something that they would really accept if you wouldn't have any a clinical experience let's say i don't think there's something that you would be able to do but also then i I did not really want to travel all the time, you know, because I think it requires a lot of traveling and can be, yeah, like really in different places. And then again, I don't know if my German would have been good enough because as I said, I was applying mostly for Germany. And so then, yeah, when you go to the hospital, you really have to talk to doctors and nurses in German. This may have been more, you know, technical because honestly I had to, relearn Italian again as well you know like all these clinical terms I didn't know before I I mean or I didn't remember before I started so uh, but you know like it wouldn't make much difference the difference would be that I would be going to the office uh, every day and yeah this would be different but yeah. hey thank you um are there ah yeah good Violetta just in time posted another question <laughs> So often the employer has no time to read long CVs, but if you want to put all your experience, you end up with a very long list of things. So what is your advice? Rather short or rather everything in detail? <laughs> so um, I think it depends for what position you apply and if it's in academia or in industry. I think in academia, they prefer to have all the details, all the, all the experience in the CV so that they can really see what you did exactly and so on. Instead, on the other hand, as uh, Violeta was saying, uh, they don't have time to read CV. So if you want to apply to industry, you have to keep it max two pages, like not longer, which I know it's not much, <laughs> but you really have to cut out a lot. Like I did not put almost anything from the time in the lab, just, you know, mentioned where I did my PhD, in which lab, and what was the focus, like one sentence maybe, and then just put a bit of the other skills, but 
use more keywords and be um, But uh, I think indeed, if they see a CV which is 10 pages long, they would not even look at it. And also, um, uh, what I've been told when I was also struggling to prepare my CV, uh, to put the most important things always first. So try to kind of put it in the first page if possible, because at least then it, they would see it and then, may, then they go to the second page. But otherwise, if there is a lot of I, um, other um, more education, what you studied and what exactly you did or the list of the papers or whatever, then they would not even get to the part that may be more interesting for them. So yeah, this is what I would uh, yeah, suggest. Okay, good. So this has been all the questions from the chat. Is there anyone else who wants to ask a question? You can also raise your hand. If you don't want to type it out. <laughs> Big silence. <laughs> I hope that I answered the wet and <laughs> they're still awake. <laughs> okay, there's a question from Nadia. What would you change during your PhD if you could? Do you, would you do mm. something different? Um, so I would, um, as I said, I would definitely do more of the courses like that are not time spent in the lab because this may be useful if you don't want to continue. I I mean, in any case, even if you want to continue in the lab, like with academic career, this will also be useful. And um, I think it may also uh, kind of make you understand a bit more what you would like to do next, to have a bit more of an idea of what other options are there, what are the skills you need, and reflect on your skills as well. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I wish I would have read more because I didn't have much time to do that. And I think that would have been uh, maybe more helpful to get more ideas and um, maybe do different experiments and so on. Um, take more holidays. <laughs> Actually, this was a, a big regret after I finished the PhD because I wanted to do like a big trip, but then, uh, you know, I was like, oh, yeah, but we have to finish the paper. And so I just had a short break after my defense and then I was again in the lab, but then I finished in the lab, like in the last day of January and the next day I was doing the new job. <laughs> so I didn't have time to do that. So this I would definitely do like if that it's really important did not do because of the paper and the experiment, but this always takes longer and longer and there is always something else. And if, yeah, at some point you really have to take care of yourself and if you need a break, take it. And uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, your experiments will not run away. <laughs> so this I think uh, may be something to do differently, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. More questions? Maybe sleeping audience. <laughs> Hello. Doesn't look like it. Nope. Okay. <laughs> then I guess if no one has any questions, I give back to Carolina. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it looks like that uh, we don't have more questions, but I think that we have lots of them. So uh, I really thank you uh, for preparing the, this lecture for us. It was really inspiring and I believe uh, beneficial for, for our participants. I also thank uh, to participants to, to, for questions and uh, I recommend you to follow us on our CTEC website or social media because we are preparing already the lectures 
for next years. So we will welcome again some another inspiring speakers. And uh, I wish you Merry Christmas and I hope you will enjoy this time and have some time to, to relax and enjoy it with your families. And see you soon. <laughs> so thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much, Carolina, for the invitation and for I hope that uh, yeah, it was useful somehow the talk. And yeah, yeah it definitely. was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.